Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Josh A. Uh, Josh S., alcoholic. Uh, it's nice to be here tonight without my glasses, so I can't see any of your faces. Feels good to be up here uh, and look out at all of this baggage. <laughs> it's, it's. Uh, I like to talk in the beginning. First of all, I should just let you know I'm a rascal a little bit. I'm just a little bit of a rascal, and I think I'll always be that way. I don't know if it's ever going away. I just kind of turn things on their side. And I don't follow rules very well. I follow rules just enough to not have you hate me, you know? And, um, and that's after the, my sobriety date is July 1st, 2003. Uh, my home group is the Hermosa Beach Men's Stag. We have a saying there, it's where the men are men and the sheep are nervous. And, uh, and my sponsor is a guy named Bill C. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to launch right into it. They told me I had 75 minutes up to. Are you kidding me? Don't worry, I won't put you through that, you know? But who knows? Because once I, I'm like, I'm, I'm like an old stubborn lawnmower, you know, that you can't get to start. But once you do, it's just going to, it's going to light on fire and keep on running. Um, so I've only had one cup of coffee and about four hours of sleep. So this is going to be real honest. Uh, anonymity is our spiritual foundation, right? And I didn't really know what that meant. I thought it just meant I was going to shut up and not tell you who I was when I was out in public. Uh, and what anonymity I've come to f- discover is that it's me effacing myself for Alcoholics Anonymous, for something greater than myself. I'm a small part of a great whole. And what's happening here is more important than my personal ambition. And so when I'm up here tonight, even though I'm in this three-piece suit, you know, I bought it on the Internet, okay? You should just know that. It just fits real well. And... uh <laughs> Because I learned to read, <laughs> and uh, among the many gifts that AA has offered me, among, among them how to sing happy birthday, you know, because in Southern California, that's what we do. Everyone sings happy birthday to the alcoholics, every single one who takes a cake every single time. And uh, we read the same things in every meeting, every single meeting, every single time. And occasionally, when you're new and you walk into AA, it kind of feels like you're in, like, you're in a Twilight Zone episode where everyone just says the same thing every time. <laughs> and you're looking around and you ask for advice, practical advice about what is wrong with your life. And they tell you things like first things first. And easy does it. And keep coming back. It works if you work it. And it just doesn't make any sense. It seems like when I got to AA, it's going to jump all over the place. This is going to be like a Quentin Tarantino movie. <laughs> so just by the end of it, everything is going to link up back together again, I'm hoping. But my supreme hope is that to be useful. My supreme hope is to be useful. That's the whole point of what we do here, is to be useful to other people. And it's easy to get sidetracked in AA. Um, so, but I, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought you guys were a bunch of Stepford wives. I just thought everyone just was a bunch of emotional invalids uh, that had no real achievements in their own life and just sat around coddling each other over things like paying the gas bill on time, you know, and... <laughs> And finally getting a driver's license at the age of 55. <laughs> and I just wasn't buying it. It just didn't seem to fit. Um, and, uh, and I'm real glad I was wrong. I'm glad that I was wrong. There's something here. There's a magic here where God and practicality are put so closely together uh, in, a, in, a, in such a way that I have yet to see in many other areas uh, that I've visited. And... We have a pipeline here to real to have practical help for other people and to put you into a phase and way of living that is based on giving that for some strange reason seems to arrest the disease of alcoholism one day at a time. Uh, but no, no cure as of yet, sorry. Transcendence might be the only cure, right? Complete ego death. But then you won't be around anyway to enjoy that ride. Um, so I grew up here in Washington, in fact. Uh, I was born in Tacoma General on a rainy Wednesday at 5 p.m., hump day. Came in with a sliding, you know, woo. And and 
my father was an alcoholic, you know, who loved my mother. And uh, my mother was a terminal optimist <laughs> and just kind of hung in there. And um, my dad wanted me for a long time, you know, but he had some problems with the military where he, uh, you know, he kind of liked it. He was an entrepreneur. Let's just put it that way. And um, and he had a hard time with medical school. You know, the, 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 the gorilla was on his back the entire time. He wanted to be a doctor, but he didn't get to be. He was a naval medic instead. Drinking got in the way of almost every dream that he chased. And uh, my mom eventually had to leave. And I was two years old. And I have two distinct memories of my father. The first one is I'm, he's tucking me in. I'm in onesies pajamas. And he's, he's uh, reading me a bedtime story. And I can, I knew that he loved me. I knew I was secure in the fact that I knew that he loved me and that I was safe. And the other memory I have is of me sitting there on the floor and he's holding a beer and the sunlight is slanting in through the window, coming in through that brown glass and making it glow or the bottle, making it glow amber. There's football on the TV screen and he's yelling at my mom and those, and that split image is the alcoholic that I had no idea I was destined to become the Dr. Jekyll and the Mr. Hyde, right? And the reason that that is such an apt metaphor for what alcoholism does to us is because that story, eventually Dr. Jekyll does not need the elixir to turn into Mr. Hyde. The monster comes of its own accord. And uh, we kind of transmogrify around here when we're drinking and when we're doing the other stuff that alcoholics do. Um, and... She left, and she was a kind of codependent, right? So she got directly into another relationship uh, with a real country boy from Billings, Montana, uh, with a you know a mustache and a barrel chest. He could fix anything, and his, he was so country. His middle name was Buster, and uh, and we, you know, and he was a tech sergeant in the Air Force and a youth pastor at the church, and yada yada yada. Here's the rap sheet world. We're in a good situation, right? Essentially. And the, the, we'd go home, and we, or the, the house that we had in Spanaway had the lawn. was We could see Mount Rainier in the backyard, and the lawn looked like fairway, and everything was meticulous, and we looked like we had it together. And the minute we'd come home at night and the door would shut, he would beat the piss out of us. And um, so for the first years, and my dad would show up drunk several times. He'd show up trying to see his son. He'd work up his nerve, and he'd show up because I was forbade from seeing him. And, uh, and I was so young, I didn't even know, right? Most of my life at that time, it was a real traumatic time for me. I can't really remember an in incredible amount of it. I have like the, mo the worst, the highlight reel of the crappiest moments is still readily available. But, you know, um, it just was a real blur. And he would show up, bang on the door, said, let me see my son, you son of a, you know? And my, and my stepdad would grab a thirty out 6 so one of the 150 loaded weapons we had in that house, and try and point it at the door, and my mom would have to jump in front of the barrel with me in her arms saying, don't let him go, let him go. And the next morning, we'd be at church, you know, <laughs> praising Jesus. It was just, that's what you did. It was just confusing. I got pistol whipped. I got concussed several times, bruises on my body, my, and me keeping it a secret from her. He's hitting her, keeping it a secret from me. There was just this whole power structure in that household growing up, and it was all centralized around looking good in front of the neighbors, you know? And uh, so I learned how to lie. Coming into AA, we meet a lot of you, <laughs> right? Coming back, oh, well, now that I have the steps, everything's great. You know, everything's wonderful. <laughs> this. This solution, I just feel like I'm walking on cloud nine, you know, and that's just not the way it works around here. You know, people, some people call it slow sobriety, but some people really, they really have a, a shift of consciousness that takes place here slowly over time. What William James would call the religious experience. Something happens here. Motivations. Just think about it for a second. Just backtrack, click your clock back and just think. You needed, I personally needed to get loaded every day somehow. It was the central point of my day. I would plan things around it if something was going to interfere with it. School interfered with it, so I made sure I was expelled from every school system I ever attended by the time I was 17. You know, Con in continuation school, independent studies, all of them gone. No formal education beyond that, you know. And friendships gone, family gone. It was the focal point of my life. And then all of a sudden, 
after a couple of stupid meetings of people saying the same three phrases over and over again, <laughs> holding hands at the end to have a prayer, you know, chewing on their own tongue, apparently, is what I see when I walk in to an AA meeting. Uh, not today, but I, that's how it was, right? A hard-boiled cynic. If you grew up the way I grew up, you'd see the world. I saw the, I, uh, the way I see the world, right? And uh, that was a tongue twister. Uh, and something changes. There's a shift that occurs. And all of a sudden, I didn't have to get loaded anymore. I didn't have to drink anymore. The desire was lifted somehow. What is that? Think about it. What is that? I'm not here even trying to pitch it to you or answer for you. But there's something. We could all probably agree if you've had that experience that there's something. And I don't know what that is, but it's powerful. And it's likely happened to most of the people sitting in this room. So all of us are here together joined in whatever this great mystery is that's keeping us together. And it seems to be that if I continue forward in purposeful action that's based in love and I do my best and I just give it my best shot and everyone's best looks different. But something that it continues to keep that at bay. And I don't know, it's weird, huh? It's pretty neat. I guess I'm grateful. Uh, and anyway, so going back to my childhood, that happened a lot. And I don't want to spend a tremendous amount of time there, but the reason I want to talk about it a little bit is because a lot of people come into Alcoholics Anonymous dual diagnosed or with grave emotional and mental disorders, abuse stories. Some of you have been hurt as children sexually or physically, emotionally, certainly most of us or a good amount of us. You know, there's a lot of stuff that occurred. And I'm here to tell you that you can recover too if you have the capacity to be honest with yourself. That I am a guy who walked into Alcoholics Anonymous at 18 years old with 10 years of heavy antipsychotic medication running through his bloodstream. You know, six, six months in a mental institution when I was 12 years old. And I'll talk about it, right? Like I, uh, uh, three psychiatric evaluations, a rap sheet of all the stuff I was and why it was that I could not seem to fit within society's standards of me. And so I had all the answers. I could name all my demons forward and backwards. I could do a field sobriety test of my neuroses, right? And, uh, and I came, and I don't know why the 12 steps worked for me, but it did. It even worked for me, the most unique human on earth, <laughs> right? So, uh, but there's a big, there's a lot of fun here. There's a lot of fun to be had, especially at our own expense, especially at our own expense, we're really not that important, right? I mean, it's like we've got this little identity we carry around and we spend all of our time defending it and we attach a whole bunch of different stuff to it, right? We dress it in the clothes we like. We force the music to, that we like through the speakers. We vote for the people we like. We root for the teams we like. And anyone, and over time, you get this whole massive collection of things we think we are and, and I start to confuse those things for who I am or what I am rather. And then I find myself getting in disagreements with other people over the things that they've collected along the way and say, oh, the things I've collected are objective truth, <laughs> you know? And you think about all that. If there was just a couple, I was just talking to Matthew about it, you know, if there was just a couple of little different things that happened in my life, I might be a completely different person. And if the development of a personality is so fragile and can be screwed with so easily, what do I have? So why do I spend so much time defending this one? as if it's like real. Anyway, I won't go there all the way, guys. I'm going <laughs> to, I tied a rope. I tied a rope around my waist and I'm backing out of the rabbit hole. <laughs> but we are likely to visit again. Uh, and so I, uh, I remember one night specifically, you know, and I was screwed up, man. I was screwed up as a kid. I fought a lot at school. I was antisocial. I wasn't really allowed to have many friends, and I would wander the woods behind my house and on the side of my house, pretend I was a knight fighting dragons, pretend that ogres were coming from under the ground, pretend I'm... what happened is I cultivated this vivid imagination as a result of all that isolation as a child, you know? And in Alcoholics Anonymous, over time, that natural creativity found a way to express itself. And the men that came into my life encouraged me to express that, you know? And I found out I, I had a whole new life passion as a result of that creativity. And I would never have, that wouldn't have been possible had it not been for that abuse and that isolation that forced me into cultivating the imagination that I now get to use to express myself. 
everything happens perfectly. It all unfolds perfectly, even though it's painful sometimes. But we all in here treat pain as if it shouldn't exist, right? <laughs> right? Like it's unnatural. Like, oh, pain, here it is. You know, this is bolt. This is crap. Send it back, you know. Re- return it to the factory. I don't want it. Or, or discomfort. We all live as if discomfort. So we avoid pain and we seek pleasure. Pleasure, huh? <laughs> that's what I'm about. I'm about that reward center in the brain, you know. And what, that's what happened when I took my first drink and I was 12 years old and I was in Andrew Gedman's garage and I was drinking vodka. And I do not remember the rest of that night except for riding home on my bike feeling like I was flying on the back of a dragon. <laughs> you know? And it was incredible. It could be, the reason being is because us as alcoholics, if you're new, welcome. Welcome the guys who are, and women who are in your first 30 days. Um, or if you're back again, if you're kicking the tires, or for whatever reason, you, like me, think that AA is just full of a bunch of brainwashed idiots like I did when I was new. Um, and it's okay to say that aloud. I don't really think everything's as sacred as we think it is. <laughs> you know, refer back to analysis of personality earlier. <laughs> um, so, but... I'm just here to encourage you. I'm just here to encourage you to let you know that, you know, this is the weirdo center of all, like the known universe. This is where all the weirdos come. If all the stuff in your car that isn't tucked away when you make a real sharp turn that goes rolling to one side, that one side, that little pocket is Alcoholics Anonymous. (laughs) So welcome, you know, be a weirdo. It's all right. Sometimes they'll even ask you if you're a weirdo to go speak places. It's crazy. I keep on waiting for them to get like a GSO to get involved or something and say, you know, you talk about out, you're, it's a little too outside of the box sometimes. Like you need to reel it in or I keep on waiting for these heroes and these mentors that I've met along the way to like sit me down and say, all right, enough is enough. <laughs> Just shut up already. But one of the cool things about this is there's a lot of young people here and we as young people are here to carry Alcoholics Anonymous into the future and make sure it's relevant because there's a lot of other ways to recover these days. And we got to make sure we're being useful and we're maximizing our u- usefulness to other people and making this place safe enough for everyone who needs it, right? I'm sure you guys didn't want to spend the money with the, you know, the deaf people. I'm sure you did not want, I don't know what the politically correct version of that is, but people who can't hear, sorry. But, you know, you want to, a lot of people in here probably didn't want to spend that money. But if there is a need for something like that and our whole job is to be useful, then why not? The money's going to get spent. Other than, there's, man, I can't tell you how many times I've been broke. I've been so broke I owed myself money, right? You just, <laughs> and the money's always there. If I'm doing the right thing and I'm plugging away, you know, and sometimes the money's not there. And guess what? I, get, I lose the thing. I find out six months later I didn't need anyway. <laughs> Big deal. It's just stuff. We're just stuff. <laughs> you know, carbon. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I... When I, when I <clears throat> was around eight years old, right around that time, you know, I really just, my, my stepdad and I got in a big argument and, um, and I, and I jumped up on the couch and I kicked him right in the cross of the face with my shin because he'd been taking me to karate. So I decided I would use it. <laughs> and, uh, he grabbed me and he knocked, he swung me like a piece of paper, like paper mache and a broke table under my back. I got knocked unconscious and, uh, and they, the cops came and incarcerated him. And my mom at the time, I mean, God bless her. She was, she was afraid she wanted to leave. There's 150 loaded weapons in the house. There's a lot of people who judged her and they're including herself, but she did the best she could. And when she found out it was that bad, she did everything she could to get me out of there. You know? So when he got incarcerated, we packed up everything in a U-Haul and we drove down in the dead of night. And I was so small, I could sleep on the blankets in the footwell of the U-Haul like a puppy and curled up, you know? And we came down to San Diego and we didn't have any money. And the minute that we were down there, my dad showed up, you know? My dad always loved my mom until the day he died, even though he, he got together with another woman because well, that's what men do, you know? If the one we want is not around, we're not going to be bored. We're just, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're... <laughs> it's like a placeholder. It's just... <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, and 
and he showed up and I remember the kind of, he was, I, I had no idea that he was struggling with alcoholism. I had no idea, you know, because I was already a kid. I'm self-centered. I'm super self-centered. You know, my sponsor always says that kids are direct competition. <laughs> they're the only, they're the only creatures more self-centered than the alcoholic. So alcoholics raising kids, you know, it's just like, man, uh, no, I want to do it. You know, uh, surrender the toy to the child, Herbert, you know? Uh, so he showed up and I remember it was my birthday and he took me and 12 and I know he didn't have a bunch of money. He took me and 12 kids to the movies, bought us all each I, candy, ice cream, popcorn, everything arranged a taxi ride two two taxis to come pick us up and take us and just, and for the rest of my time in that apartment, that condominium place, uh, I had the coolest dad around, you know? He made me feel proud to have, and, and I'd go spend time with him up on his ranch. And um, we got in a fight the second time I was up there. I was always a weird, dark kid. I don't know if you could tell from my sense of humor. Uh, but I've been this way a long time. I'm inquisitive, and I'm an adrenalized thinker, and I've got a dark turn of mind. And, um, and none of that today invalidates my pursuit of light or my ultimate perfection and connection to God. None of it. Right. There's a lot of big pieces of ourselves we have in this room that we're trying to rob of love and rob of acceptance and pretend like it shouldn't be there. And that's the reason we keep on doing the wrong thing when no one's looking, because we have not assimilated all those pieces of ourselves and practiced a little bit of radical self-love where all of it belongs, not just the pieces we like and look good in public. All of it must be acknowledged. You know, it's okay to be honest about who you really are. There's a, there's a great uh, talker, an intellectual a psychiatrist, and he talks about, you know, Jung's idea of the shadow. And the shadow is that piece of ourselves that a lot of us don't want to acknowledge. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, I feel like we undergo a similar journey where we have to acknowledge and touch that shadow within ourselves. And Jung believed that in order to treat a patient, if you condoned his behavior, it was just as damaging as if you uh, condemned it. Right. And you had to reach some sort of equanimity in order to really deal and be useful with the man in front of you. And the only way for a doctor to do that or a sponsor, if you want to apply it here, was to confront the beast within himself. The proverbial going into the, dr the cave to vanquish the dragon. We all have a dragon. And uh, there's an old Icelandic saying that I heard my friend Geesley say when we were in Sedona, which is it's an old it, it, the, 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 it's what is it? Hold on. The man who has no dragon to slay will eventually turn the sword upon himself. And what that means is you get an alcoholic and you sober him up and you bring him in here and he has no purpose. It's only a matter of time before he eats himself or she eats herself alive. Because I'm talking to the women too. I'm a man, so predominantly a lot of my things, my pronouns, usage will be masculine. You know, because I got self-centeredness on top of it, <laughs> uh, on top of biology. And but what I mean is that this this thing works for anyone. This thing works for everyone. Anyone who applies themselves honestly and gives it a little shot. I'm, I don't know how to. And you can't give that enthusiasm to anyone. You can't give that willingness to anyone. There's nothing I can do to speed up your enlightenment. There's nothing I can do to speed up your process. And guess what? There's nothing you can do either except just give it your best shot. And whatever your best shot looks like today, I hope you're giving it. Because it's worth it. I can tell you through all the trials and tribulations that have fallen on my doorstep in Alcoholics Anonymous as a now 33-year-old male who walked into Alcoholics Anonymous as an 18-year-old male, it has been absolutely worth every moment of pain and discomfort to be where I sit with the perception shift that I've had. It has been worth every piece of childhood abuse, every mental institution, every, you know, disappointing look from my mother or my friends, every lost relationship every bit of money that I misinvested or watched slip away, and with it, my, what I thought were my chances for happiness. It's been worth it all. So I hope, I just wish you could have that. I hope you have that, and I hope you get to have that. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. You can't really mess it up, you know? We think that we're driving all the time, but it comes, come to find that it's on tracks, <laughs> you know? It's kind of a train, and you just got to keep on sho shoveling coal, so anyway, back to uh, my daddy. Um, so we got in a fight. 
we got in a fight and uh, I wanted to watch. I was a dark kid. Like I said, I loved horror movies ever since I was a kid, right? My first, I'm a writer now and I write, I write horror, dark fiction, science fiction, weird stuff. Like I like that stuff. I've always liked it. I play in a black death metal band, right? Not very spiritual, <laughs> right? But that's like, but that's just what I, it's what I like. It's my filter. It doesn't invalidate my pursuit of light because there is a whole picture to this complex Rubik's cube of a human being. And one belongs just as much as the other belongs. Am I able to love myself as a whole person today? A fallible person today. A person who still has ongoing character defects. It's okay. You know? God. I mean, if I want this human experience, that's part of it, Bubba. You know, you want to be a human being, that's what it looks like. It hurts sometimes. It's unfair sometimes. The idea of a morality is questioned sometimes. You know? I won't go there yet. Rabbit hole avoided. Uh, and, and so I was watching this horror movie, and he didn't want me to watch it. He'd be getting more religious at the time. And he told me, no, I refuse. My son, you're 10 years old. You're not going to watch this, you know? And I got mad at him, and he took me to the airport, and he said, I love you, son, as I was walking down that the gangplank or whatever you'd call it. The umbilicus. <laughs> the aluminum umbilicus. <laughs> Say that fast. Uh, and I didn't say I love you back. And he called a couple of times and I didn't answer because I could hold a grudge already. I just wanted what I wanted when I wanted it because I'm selfish. I'm a kid, you know. It's not like I, was, I had alcoholic thinking then. It's not like that. I just it's uncomfortable because I had been abused and like <laughs> I was kind of crazy and like uh, angry and afraid and didn't really know what life was about yet. And, um, and so I'd take my pleasures where I could get them, right? And one of them was horror movies. I didn't get it. So I'm pissed. Pretty simple. Um, and we got a call one day that he'd been found on the road dead. You know, he'd been struck by a vehicle. And uh, and after that, I remember not crying at his funeral. I remember not crying at home or in my bedroom. I just started going downhill quick. Uh, my 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 antisocial behavior that was already d present in some of, in the six years of off and on therapy I'd had up until that time. You know, just went full blown. I started smoking cigarettes and stealing them from my mom. I broke the religious artifacts in our house. You know, I just, uh, I would tell people in authority to go after themselves. And I started doing that two years later. I'm running away from home. I'm got blue Liberty spikes in my hair. I'm telling my mom, I'm calling, I'm threatening to kill my mom. You know, she took all the knives out of the house. And, uh, so she called, she picked me up one day and told me my grandpa was having a heart attack her father, and we go in the middle of the night, and her friend's with her, and her friend is real nervous. <laughs> it's driving like, you know when you're doing like a, one of those mob jobs like in the movies, and like one guy's like really nervous, and they're like, something's fishy, you know? <laughs> I didn't have that because I was an idiot, and uh, so I'm just driving, you know, blue hair, I don't care, I don't care, I'm so angsty, leave me alone, I'm so edgy, and, uh, and we get to this hospital, and it's, it's, I think to myself, it's a real small hospital. <laughs> but I, whatever, we walk in. I'm like, there's almost no one in this waiting room. And we walk through the other back door because I am just keep on going. You know, my same experience is in Alcoholics Anonymous that look like this, right? <laughs> Work the steps, fine. I don't care. I hate you guys. Where's my fourth? Here it is. I'll write the fourth step, okay? Like, I don't even know why I did it. And, uh, and we walk into a back room, and the door shuts, and a devil says, I'm in a mental institution. And that's how that started, you know, <laughs> the new educational facility <laughs> trying to rehab, you know, this social pariah and uh, give him names for all his monsters. And um, and I learned a lot there. I was there for six months. And then while I was there, I remember my mom coming to sit me down and look at me and said, and that's when I found out that my dad was had a high blood alcohol content when he died. You know, he was hit by some woman who's drinking and he was drinking or, you know, it's just it was like the law of attraction and his work was done, you know. And for a long time, I hated the fact that my father had died, right, because I felt like he was the ghost that haunted my life. I felt like um, he should have been there. Or I should have been rescued or my mom should have done something different or something. You know, I wanted to have a man show me how to be a man. I don't know how to be a man. I got a five foot two, pretty anxious, but lovely, beautiful, loving woman raising me how am I going to do this I don't know what to do I don't know how to fix a car I don't know how to play sports I hate sports you know I play guitar <laughs> and uh, I have come to a place where I fully understand that my father could have done nothing other than what my father did he did the best he could and he loved me and I know that 
And I know for a fact that because of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and the love of perfect strangers, I'm a man today that he would be proud of. And you can't give that kind of sense. You can't even articulate that kind of sense. It's an experience where you sit in moments of your own life in the middle of the storm and think to yourself, my God, how did I ever become a man that could handle this? And you understand that you didn't become a man. It is a cohesive grouping together. It's an event. This is an organism. We're a part of it. We are not the star of it. You know, despite my, it's being my turn to be up here on this side, right? I feel grateful for that because I feel like I have a kind of a different outlook than a lot of people who circulate speaking in Alcoholics Anonymous, except for a couple of my friends were on. I'm so lucky to be surrounded by the mentors I got in my life, by the way. Solid men. Solid men. Um, and I get a chance to try to, if I could get you to just ask some questions to yourself when you leave tonight. You just think about, well, huh. You know, I never really thought of it that way. Or, huh, maybe I'm wrong. Because I'm certainly not necessarily right, right? But the whole point is to shake up the snow globe. Shake it up. <laughs> shake it up a little bit. It's all right. You know, the snow settled. Jesus, come on. <laughs> Don't be so prudish. Just relax. God, I'm hot. Uh... <laughs> I got it on the internet. We're good. Don't worry. <laughs> so... uh after that occurred, uh, I learned how to drink. I learned how to drink, you know, and I'm going to get the hell out of my childhood here, but I've been going back and forth, so I think I'm doing all right. Um, that's what I learned in there, essentially. I learned that everyone out there had someone waiting for them. Everyone out there had a story of a girlfriend, which I'd never experienced. I wanted to sit badly, oh, God, if only, you know. And like, you know, and then I, everyone had a boyfriend or someone who was waiting on the other side of that gate, and their, the whole idea of it was so destructive and noir. It was like, you know, it's just you and me, babe, like against the world, right? And that idea of just getting loaded and just riding off into the sunset while everything burns. <laughs> just, and then you pull up two lawn chairs to just swirl the ashes. Like I, that idea is just so, st it's still so beautiful to me. <laughs> I'm just like, man, isn't that it? The Bonnie and Clyde story. Love it. And, uh, and so I went out and that's when I went to Andrew Gedman's garage at 12 years old after getting released from that place. And I was violently anti-religious. I remember I had a, a bracelet in arts and crafts that I had made that said F Jesus. You know, there was three more letters in it. I made it at the mental institution arts and crafts. <laughs> and, I was, and I was in seventh grade, you know. And I wore all black and I cut myself and I was, you know, you know, just a weird guy. And, and my... Uh, and I started to get loaded, you know? I mean, I, I drank. I like Steel Reserve. I like 211. I like cheap booze. And when you're young, that's the, you generally the kind of, you're not like, oh, give me the top shelf, Fred. You know, it's not like that. It's like, hey, so-and-so's older brother, we buy him a sixer, he'll get us this, you know? Get Steel Reserve 211, you know? Because that's the stuff that'll get you to the moon and back right away with less than $5, and you can still have money for nachos. <laughs> <laughs> I was just a pragmatist. And, uh, and so we, uh, and I proceeded to get loaded for as, uh, as much as I could, you know, and I might've done meth once for two years. And so I, <laughs> that's kind of how that goes. <laughs> and so there's, it got weird. It got weird. I remember I, for a time, I mean, I was just so confused. My identity was just getting chewed up, ripped apart, put back together, glued. It was a Mr. Potato Head of trying to figure out what the hell I was, right? And I just would walk into this situation and be like, oh, I kind of, I, I don't know. Yeah, sure. You know, let's try this. <laughs> yeah, okay. Right, yeah, we'll worship Satan. You know, <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, what's this? All right, I'll do, I'll be a punk rocker. I'll make my own clothes. And, um, and by the end of all this stuff, uh, you know, I'd been kicked out of high school. Uh, I've been kicked out of continuation school and kicked out of independent studies and blah, blah, blah. And, and, uh, and I was writing my own in code. I was writing in code. I had my own alphabet. I still remember the whole thing. And, um, and I would write my own poems in code so they couldn't be deciphered, right? And, and I thought I was the incarnation of a Viking warlord that should have been born a thousand years ago. And I figured that I was, should have been raiding the Carolingian Empire. And that's why I was having so many problems here on, in this modern day and age. And that, because if you shit your pants while you're on a long ship, you know, 
And they just, all off says, no problem, you know. <laughs> I, I shit mine too. <laughs> and, uh, and you just keep on sailing ahead. And I was a urinator. But here's the thing. <laughs> I thought this was a UA meeting, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, I mean, I just, I was one of those guys who just couldn't handle his liquor right away. And I would be fun for about five minutes, and then I would get super depressed. I was like the dark one, you know. We're all going to die. <laughs> I was like that guy. <laughs> Your life is meaningless. No one will remember you in a hundred years. And just uh, like, don't invite Josh to the parties, you know? And then I'd get back up and then I'd be naked, running around naked. Everyone in San Diego had seen me naked, you know? And they're like, and then I challenged people to kung fu duels. <laughs> and by, and I didn't know kung fu. <laughs> I really, but, but, so around that time, my mother's like, just send this guy. We got to send him back, you know. So they called up the old mental institution and sent me to the adult outpatient program. So I showed back up to the same place like, hey, guys, hey, Carol. Carlos would – and Carlos would show, show up in his white van in the morning to pick me up. And my mom is just going, oh, I'm so proud of my ripe little turnip, Josh. He's, he's just polished and ready to go out into the world, you know. And I'm like, see you later, Ma. I'm going for the day back to the mental institution, sitting next to the schizophrenics. And while there, I met a schizophrenic – you know, go figure. And, uh, and we started hanging out <laughs> because I figured he would teach me Kung Fu because he was an old Marine. And he's like, I had four black belts. And, and anyway, and I snuck drugs into the hospital and got them all loaded. I had to go make amends for that, for getting all the schizophrenics loaded in the hospital. So basically what I'm trying to say is I had a high moral fortitude when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I've always been a little bit of a rascal. And, uh, but I take myself a lot less seriously today. And that's why it's the, it's kind of funny to be a rascal now because it all is not so serious. You know, it's a lot, the pressure's off. The train's not leaving the station. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to hurry up to get your happiness. It's all right. There's a quietude that just kind of surfed through the room right now. Right. And that's because that's true. Your heart knows that's true. It's already there. You're not learning something new. When someone says something that touches you, it's not because it's brand new information. It is because that is an old forgotten truth. You already innately know that. But we learn so much from the time we're given this little identity. A good Josh, do that. Bad Josh, don't do that. You know, that, and then we're told how to act growing up and our society reinforces it. And, but the very deep, 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 deep down within us are these innate truths we already have in our heart. So when you feel that resonance, that's because it's already there, brother and sister. It's already there, brother and sister. God, look, I turn it into my turn it into my. No, I'm just kidding. But this is a church. It's huge too. I just want like a horn section, you know. <laughs> and so, oh man, I know. <laughs> yeah. These little skits and scenes play out all day long behind my eyes. You guys are getting a little sliver of the iceberg here. But I, sometimes I'll be sitting by myself and just burst out laughing because <laughs> something occurs to me or I see it. It's just so funny. Some people move away. <laughs> no, <I'm> just, <laughs> <coughs> but so around 18 of all that fun stuff, my mom said, send me to this place. And I remember I went and saw them all talk at a, a, a dual diagnosis place. I was so familiar with these places by now. It's like going to an Alano club after you've gone to Alano Beach. You're like, oh, we're going to go to the Alano club. Oh, there's an Alano club here. You, like, know about the parlance of AA. And so, that's how I was in the mental health community. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, we're sitting down for cog work right now. Okay, this is group over here. And, you know, do you guys have any juices? Like, do you have any juice boxes? <laughs> I'm parched. Uh, and these guys were sitting around in a circle talking about how they were their brother's keeper today. You know? And that, you know, they, they have a relationship with their parents again. And, like, they know what it's like to have integrity and hold each other accountable. And, oh, my God. You're like, I roll. You know, thank you, Dudley do right. I appreciate your uh, infomercial. If you guys want to scoot on out of here and get the hell out of my life. And my mom's like, well, you're going to go visit them for 30 days. And, uh, and I didn't want to, obviously. 
So finally, she convinced me I had to or else I was going to get kicked out because she found some other stuff in my possession that shouldn't have been in my possession and that, you know, she threatened to turn into the police and I'd already had a record for building bombs when I was 13 and, you know, like she turned me into the sheriff's office for anyway. I have so many stories like that. Like, what is this morbidly death-obsessed kid doing? Like, when Heaven's Gate, remember that? The cult back in San Diego that all wore the Nike shoes and killed themselves when Hale Bob's Comet came, right? I was 10 or like 9, and I was so fascinated. I was so fascinated by this. I cut out all the news articles and pasted them on a poster board and put it on my wall in my room. And my mom came home and said, what the hell is wrong with this kid? So stuff like that. Imagine like a thousand stories like that. And then here I am in AA. And uh, via this all-male sober living. And I just didn't want to do it, man. I walked in there, so I wrote my internet girlfriend a really long message, you know. (laughs) And I had an internet girlfriend before it was cool. It was still very creepy. The likelihood of that I was talking to someone who was linked into like a government state-run electricity line in a van with slitted windows, you know. And facial hair down to his his rattlesnake belt buckle was like a, a real likelihood. It was a possibility. And and I went there, and uh, a lot of the guys. I wanted to leave, right? I wanted to leave right away. I remember being at my first AA meeting in in Hollywood, in West Hollywood, California, and sitting out there. And I was had long black hair, tank top. You know, I had an upside down cross carved into this arm. I had a pentagram carved into my chest. I had combat boots up to my knees, four holes in my face because they made me take out my piercings, chains down to my boots, dickies tucked in, looking at people like I wanted to eat them. And I hated AA. I hated it. It was filled with beautiful people. And in this area especially, it was all like breast augmentations and white teeth and brand new cars and flashy clothes. And I'm like sitting there with clothes I haven't washed in five days, you know, hating everyone because I thought they were all better than I like. It's like, please don't. T- the kind of guy I was in AA for the first year is like, oh, God, God, I wish they'd come up to me. Why won't anyone talk to me? You know, why won't anyone talk to me? I wish people liked me. I feel like I'm such a bad person. I suck. I suck. We suck, man. Why? We do this wrong. Oh, wait, look, here's someone's coming. Oh, hey, oh, they're looking at me. Don't look. Don't be weird. Don't be weird. Just back away. Just take a deep breath. Pretend like you don't need them. Just act. Okay, you're good. You're good. Okay, they're coming. No, they're really coming. Oh, God, they're coming. They're coming. They're coming. And then, and then hey, get the F out of here. I don't need you. Right? The minute I say, the minute they talk to me, I'm like, go. And uh, and then the same process would repeat. I was just, I, I want your recognition. Let's be honest. I want your worship. I want you to just a little bit of worship, just a spoonful. I don't need all of it. And then I want you to go away. <laughs> you know, I don't want to hang out with you. Like you hear it a lot. People, I want to be invited so I can say no. <laughs> and uh, just so I can feel want, like desired. Every human deserves that. <laughs> and, uh, and so I went through that house and a lot of the guys who sat me down, they're, they're gone. I wanted to leave so many times, man. And they said, I remember Jesse Gamboa jumping up on the bed and said, hey, man, where are you going? This hasn't started yet. You know, it hasn't even started yet. He's drunk. <laughs> you know, I remember I remember uh, the, the manager jumping down my jumping down my throat drunk. The other manager drunk. Almost all the people I went through that house with are loaded or got loaded for a while and came back to Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a couple of us left. And I used to get so pissed, man. I would jump. I would run. I would hide on the top of that building. Uh, I would ru- pretend to run away. And so this house was really structured, highly structured, like intense, not AA, but they took us to AA meetings every day. And uh, it was all about behavior modification and like being your brother's keeper and learning how to keep each other accountable. And there were a thousand rules and they changed the rules every day. It was like the TSA, you know, they just change them every day. And then you'd have to play catch up. And, uh, and then you'd be like, how did I break the strike? That was not a strike last week. You know, say, so, well, the rule changed, you know, get humble. And, uh, and we'd yell at each other, and it was intense, man. Um, but we had a Christmas show, and about for the first six months, I was not doing anything. I took about 26 days, which was seen as weak, you know, in the group mentality. And, you know, he's going to leave. He's not going to make it. And I wasn't. I wasn't planning on making it. I was buying time to get the hell out of here. I hated it. And uh, And I remember praying every night to not wake up. But I had no courage to leave. 
you know, but I just did wanted some sort of weird, like my aorta to explode <laughs> in the middle of the night. Just be like, it was a freak accident, but at least he died sober. <laughs> you know, then I just wouldn't have to do this. I wouldn't have to do it anymore. And, uh, and then I'd wake up and have to suffer through the existence of being who I was, right? Which is just a very selfish, self-centered thief, crawl, army crawling through my mom's bedroom while she's sleeping, timing the movements of the rusty hinges with her snores so that I could get into her purse, you know? I had it down to a science. And I used to congratulate myself at how ninja-like I was, you know, that kung fu with the schizophrenic was really paying off, <laughs> you know? And, uh, man... And I found myself in a lot of crazy situations. And when I was 12 years old, I remember, and I forgot to mention this, and I was in that mental institution. I got transferred to a medium security residential treatment center. I was there a total of six months. And I got blamed for something I didn't mean. It wasn't me. I got, it really, I got wrongly re accused of something. My privileges got stripped. It's like getting thrown in the hole for a crime you didn't commit. And uh, I was in the quiet room where it's all cement. You can't do anything. You can't touch anything. If you punch something, you're going to break a bone. And... I just had enough. And so when I got released back into my side of the ward, which was the non-suicide risk zone, I had shoes. I had one pair of shoes. I was allowed. I took those shoelaces out and I double knotted them. I put them up against the hinges of that door and I shut the door and I waited till everyone was done with their rounds and I lifted up my ankles to my sides and I felt my life drifting away. And I remember how peaceful it was, you know, and you see here lately in the news, a lot of people going out with hanging. It's a peaceful way to go. And, uh, and it, and it, I didn't feel that kind of peace again until I took my first drink. You know, I tell, I remember, I'll finish the story, Josh. Don't get too sidetracked yet. <laughs> You're talking about killing yourself, <laughs> you know. But did you see this new movie? <laughs> no. Uh, and I remember not, I remember distinctly not wanting to do it. Like there's 80% of me, I was talking to Matthew about it. It was just like, man, I really wish I didn't have to do this. I wish there was some other way. You know, but I just can't stand it and no one loves me. And my mom abandoned me here and my dad is dead and I got this shit kicked out of me. I don't have any friends. I don't know how to look at myself. I don't know how to act with myself. I don't know how to love anyone. I don't know what love is. I don't have any family. I don't have any, like, I, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, this is a barren, a barren wasteland is what I've become, you know? And, and but, I, but I had to do it to prove a point, <laughs> right? I had to tell everyone how they'd screwed up and make everyone sad and know that they'd screwed up. And I was willing to follow it all the way to that length, you know, because I'm emotionally immature, maybe. Um, and I felt my life slipping away. And it was like pins and needles. It was like riding waves of pins and needles. And my knot broke or I lost my nerve. I can't remember. I really had no oxygen in my brain, right? <laughs> but I woke up with bruises on my knees and a welt around my neck. And, uh, and I was like, well, that was close. I was glad I didn't do it. I think a lot of people, in lieu of what's happened here recently, I think a lot of people wish they wouldn't have done it. I had a coworker I worked with, tried to get him sober for eight years, subtly, you know, suggesting things or mentioning things or, and he was a good man. We were close. We worked together for 40 hours a week for eight years straight. And he lost his job for drinking on the job and he killed himself. You know, within two weeks, tried to bring him to meetings. He tried doing it one time. They put him in the mental institution. I went to his house and cut up all the carpet because he had about four pints of blood all over the place. Cut up the carpet and the padding, rolled it up, put it in stuff for him because he was so lazy. He was huge. Six foot three, about 410 pounds. Big man. A lot of blood. <laughs> you know, and, uh, <laughs> and he, and I put it in my, I put it in a garbage bag and put it in my car, I remember. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if I got pulled over on the way to my AA meeting tonight with this carpet, bloody carpet in the back of my car that's been there for six days and smells like an abattoir? And, uh, just Ed Gein driving through, officer, don't mind me. Just making a suit, uh, for my next AA pitch, <laughs> you know, uh, and, but he died, and man, I'll tell you what, the first thought that came into rose in my heart when I found out that he had gone all the way this time, you know, he cut him, he cut both wrists, he took Drano, he took like 100 milligrams of only 5 milligram a day medication and drank two pints of vodka all at once. He wanted to go. Wasn't a 12-year-old half-hearted suicide attempt at mental institution, you know? He was done, and the first thought I thought was, man, that poor guy's going to have to do it all over again, you know? We just die of confusion around here, and we die of confusion in Alcoholics Anonymous, too. Some of you are sitting out there thinking that you're not good enough the way you are. Some of you are sitting out there thinking that you actually have discovered the right way to work the steps, and this is the only way to work the steps, and anyone who doesn't work the steps this way is full of it, right? 
we all have our objective truth. We all, we're tribalistic. We can't help but structure ourselves that way since the beginning of time. Since, the, since agriculture, effectively, that's when the real structure began, right? And, and anthropologists say that's about 12,000 years ago. Is that right, Maverick? And, um, and it's interesting when you relax a little bit with how you think, how fixed everything is, right? It's like a movie set. You think that's real when you're watching the movie, but you pull away from that camera and you see that there's edges to the set that you can actually mix and match the pieces, change the color, paint it up. Your belief system is structured. It's built over time. That's the way it comes. It's not like you were zapped. That's it. Hey, this is a belief system. No, it's structured. And, and, and there's two sides, and you build that stuff, the thing up with a hammer, right? But there's two sides to a hammer. One of them is for sinking in nails, and one of them is for pulling them out. And so for the first five years of my sobriety, it was all about structuring my sobriety and structuring myself and knowing how to work the steps. And I, and I got a sponsor, and I remember I had one year sober, and, uh, and I didn't think I was going to have it. I was never going to stay. Like, I don't even get it while I'm standing here with almost 15 years of sobriety. I hated AA. <laughs> Truthfully, <laughs> I liked my house better. You know, I thought we were the tough ones. Like we really worked the, the end of these, these lames over there. Like we're really doing it. And, uh, and I left that place and I got involved in a group of people in Alcoholics Anonymous who were really working the steps. And, uh, and I began to really sponsor people. I've sponsored people ever since I came here and was able to. I've never been without a sponsee. And I can tell you right now, if you are not sponsoring people, you're missing out on a fantastic part of the journey. The sole point of the recovery process is so that you can outfit yourself to give it away to other people. And if you're not doing that yet, I'm, and my sponsor taught me you don't give it away to, to keep it. You give it away to even get it in the first place. And if you're not giving it away, you don't have it yet. That's uncomfortable. But what it is, is I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to challenge you to rise to the occasion to do that because some people think, well, I'll just be a greeter. That's no sponsor's not for everyone. And that's true. That is true. You're going to be all right if you don't sponsor people, most likely. If you've already made it this long, you're probably going to be all right, right? But what you're, what you're missing out on is the ability to look. It's the difference between reading about a movie review in a paper and going to see it yourself with the popcorn and the butter and no one else in the theater rented out with the 4D. Everything's moving and it's just encompassing. It's the, all the difference in the world from reading some crappy guy in his grandma's basement writing a really mean review on Rotten Tomatoes, right? <laughs> I haven't had sex in eight years, so I became a critic, you know, but it's just... <laughs> And you'll meet, and you'll meet those people in Alcoholics Anonymous too, right? You're just like, holy moly, man! You're like a, you're like a sixth grader's volcan, volcanic experiment, you know, waiting to just blow with mitochondria. You're just backed up, you know. Go see someone, man, Jesus. And there is, and that's the stuff we don't talk about in AA too. There's a whole bunch we don't talk about because we don't think it's proper, right? But a lot of people go out over sex in AA. Myself included could easily be an easy candidate for that. You know, I kind of have had phases in life <laughs> and, uh, and without making anyone uncomfortable here because there are women here and we need to honor women in Alcoholics Anonymous and make them feel a part of and not put them, our thumb down and put them into the, the roles that society has already set for them if they don't want to be in them. You know, oh, you're just a lady. You just go to your women's stag and cry for the first hour. <laughs> you know, it's like we got to make sure that we're, making it all inclusive around here and honoring our sisters in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, and I haven't always done that. I haven't always done that. And I've had experiences that have changed the way I look at that, right? I remember sitting one time and I had just discovered casual dating. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's an ongoing discovery. It's an excavation process. I consider myself an archaeologist <laughs> for science. And, <laughs> and so... Uh, I was sitting in the meeting and I remember saying something that was real crude and it was a mixed meeting and it was 11th step meeting. And I remember a, a good friend of mine, Mike R came up to me afterwards. He said, you know, there's women in this meeting, Josh, you can't say stuff like that. And it didn't hurt my feelings. I just knew I was ashamed, right? I didn't get defensive. I just said, you're right. And I didn't really realize it, right? Cause I'm always the rascal. Sometimes the rascal pushes the envelope a little too far. And I've had many of those experiences where it, if you do not defend the personality you didn't even have a say in creating anyway, 
Think about that, you know? (laughs) If you don't defend it for one second and you let this massive, beautiful organism that is our society and Alcoholics Anonymous and, and our community impact you like a like ner- like a nervous system there are synaptic 10 oh i got 20 oh man you're screwed people <laughs> now we're going to go into a little bit of the rabbit hole <laughs> now but but also i'll back up from that point for a second cuz i'll get there again what happened when I found I left that that house on bad terms and told them to go screw themselves, and I kind of ran a tirade through Alcoholics Anonymous in my early sobriety. I was out of my mind still. I remember the first day I graduated the structured all male sober living. I took off all my clothes and ran naked through the rain. You know, I was just so free. I was free, and uh, and I I got I spent a whole bunch of money on my very first credit card. In the first two weeks, I spent twenty five hundred dollars. I had a Navy SEAL waterproof knife I could wear in the shower, you know. I had throwing hatchets. I had a CD player for my car and a DVD player that I could watch movies while I drove, you know. Like, I just, what are you doing? Like, you're a, I mean, as a kid, I was emotionally immature. I had no idea what I was doing. And that place said, hey, man, you're obviously not ready for this. Uh, you're going to be in the house again. We're going to strip your status. You need to stay here for another two months. I'm like, I'm already paying rent on another. No, go screw yourself. So I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, hardcore, and I'd loved it by then. Here's the thing. I've never not loved AA. I mean, except for the beginning part. But like, I really, but I really enjoy Alcoholics Anonymous. I like helping people. I like talking to the atheists, which you're welcome here. You're welcome in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're an atheist or a non-believer, you're on the fence, you don't know, you're welcome here. Don't let anyone else tell you different. And if you're on medication, you're welcome here. If you have a doctor and you got this stuff, do not feel guilty. And if anyone in Alcoholics Anonymous is giving you that kind of medical advice without a couple of letters after their name, do not listen. Go talk to some other people. And if you're giving that advice, I just encourage you. I know your heart's in the right place. Sometimes you're just trying to help. You obviously think they're full of crap, right? They're just abuse. We could go down the whole list of why that's, it's all right to call someone out on that, right? But ultimately, they'll find that out for themselves, And you do not want to be the 50-50 risk that you take where you have a real person who might end up committing suicide because their mind has now been altered and they have a massive dip. As a guy who was on heavy antipsychotic medication for over a decade, I can tell you when you change one of them, your dopamine levels, your mind, your serotonin, everything crashes. And you may come to think, I can't tell you. I remember one time I was was on all those meds and I was coming down off of the thing I did one time in my life. Uh, and, And I... And I walked up a ladder in my garage. I couldn't find anything to hang myself with. And, and I searched frantically. And the only thing I could come up with was my mom's craft, arts and crafts yarn. <laughs> right? And so I started doubling and trebling and braiding this yarn to kill myself with. This bright yellow yarn. And I put it on the, and I tied it up around the rafter and I got the, 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 my, my ladder put up and hung up. And as I started walking toward it, Maybe not to do it, but I was pretty like, you know, when you're, when you're coming down and you don't, it's just bad, man. It's just so dark. It's the worst depression you've ever felt. You're hungry. You can't think. You can't tire when you're, it's just terrible. And, uh, someone rang the doorbell. <laughs> someone rang the doorbell the minute I was about to step up that thing. And I can't tell you how many moments my school got shot up and someone interrupted me to give me a CD 60 seconds before walking into that bathroom where the two people who died, got a bullet in the back of the head because they were standing at one of the two of the three urinals the third one was mine if someone wouldn't have interrupted me to give me a cd as i started walking again i had a 60 second delay on my way to had to pee so bad i could taste it you know but someone interrupted me and i didn't die that day like i can't tell you how many situations when i was born with an umbilical cord around my neck you know my dad's like cut her open (laughs) and uh or when my, my tonsils almost swelled up and I started asphyxiating in my crib. My dad had to drive me to the hospital and put a finger down my throat because he was a naval medic. Or the time I drank a whole bunch of perm shampoo. And luckily my dad had the stuff to make me throw up right away. Or the time I jumped off a dock at two years old and went floating with my feet up with those floaties in between two boats. And they had to give me mouth to mouth. I've just been trying to die my whole life. You know, and uh, and here I am in an AA meeting, <laughs> and we make jokes like I want to say, and my mom's proud, you know, but my mom really is proud because you guys taught me how to make amends. And while I was going through that process with those people who were really working the steps after I left, you know, I made the amends. 
I made the amends, and, and uh, right around that time, I got my dad's side of my family back into my life, you know? And uh, although I said I wasn't going to say anything, you know, my grandpa and my uncle are here tonight. And um, <clears throat> my, my dad's dad. And I remember all the things that have touched my life as a result of saying yes in Alcoholics Anonymous. You learn how to say yes in Alcoholics Anonymous, it becomes somewhat of a habit. You learn how to say yes to other things in your life. And not after, ta- and, and after not had t- having real contact with that side of the family for a long time since my father's after his death and after I, I tried once or twice, I think about it, right around 12, when all the stuff started getting ugly, you know, like that's when it kind of got real patchy. And uh, they invited me up to a family reunion. I hadn't seen them in a long time. And I was three and a half, four years sober, maybe, you know, and I went up and I've reconnected with that side of the family. And I, I'm incredibly grateful. I feel like each time I get with them, I know my father better, I know where he came from. That ghost I never, that could never, the shoes I could never fulfill because I never even witnessed them moving in my life, right? I feel, I, I feel like I've gotten a relationship with my father again, and I've gotten, and I love him. I feel like my capacity for love gets larger and larger with each year and each month that I get sober, that I stay sober. And I, I feel like eventually all I see is love. All there is is love. That's it. And the whole point is instead of being loving, the goal is to one day be the love. Instead of needing to be loving, to be the love. And I don't know if that will impact you or not or if that even makes sense because it's not an intellectual thing, Right. You can only take intellect up to a certain point, which brings me back to this experience. And so we're working the steps, and I'm serious. I'm, I'm, we're giving them honey and orange juice. They're D, they got, I got drunks DTN on my couch. You know, we're really working the steps with people. We're reading the big book, Adam. And then we're reading the 12 and 12, Adam. And then we're doing the service manual. If you ever read that sleeping manual? That <laughs> we're doing, I read all of them several times because we would never stop working the steps. We're like a shark, you know? <laughs> You can't stop swimming or you die. And that's how it felt. And so we're, it was intense. And, uh, and I thought all the old timers were lazy. And, you know, easy does it. First things first, you know. Yeah, people are dying, gramps, you know. <laughs> and uh, we got a live one. And it, it was fun and it was exhilarating to have the answer. You know, to have the answer. And that's what a lot of us do is we undergo this process of finding the answer in Alcoholics Anonymous, weaponizing it and proceeding to cram it down everyone else's throat as quickly as humanly possible. It's a very human thing. Humans do that. And uh, sorry, not just alcoholics. (laughs) Um, And that began to hurt. Using being the Inquisition, entering meetings and dividing the dry drunks from the ones who'd work the steps. You know, did you do a fifth step really? Were you honest? Confess! You know, that's how it felt all the time. And I was good at it too. I mean, those, those are the guys who make the best sponsors, right? They're just beating the crap out of their sponsees. I remember marching guys to Curtis to the liquor store, grabbing him by the back of his shirt and saying, what are you drinking, buddy? I'm buying, you know? And he's like, I don't weigh 17. He's like, I don't want to drink. I'm like, sure you do. Look at the way you're living, Curtis. You know? <laughs> and I had to make amends to Curtis, right? I had to make amends to a ton of people. And when I was two years sober, after I was running around naked and being all crazy and spending all this money, you know, and like sleeping like a vampire and losing my job and just, but, but I'm free and I'm sober. So sober is enough, you know? And just b- b- stealing the entire treasury of my Wednesday night meeting, 650 bucks. You're not a real treasure until you steal all the AA money, you know. <laughs> you got a lot here, so you better choose carefully. <laughs> Do not ask me. I've been rehabilitated, luckily. Uh, but but I, I was crazy, you know. And then there came a point where that sponsor, I was dying, man. I was dying. I had so much spiritual ego, I couldn't stand it anymore. And it was not a safe place. And I felt wrong. I felt like what we were doing was wrong. And the same literature I was reading didn't feel like the same program I was working. There was no love in it. It was all ego. And uh, my girlfriend at the time drank again. And it devastated me. It was the first girl I really kind of loved, besides my internet girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I... Uh, was went to Al-Anon and was sitting in a codependent situation watching her in meetings and taking her to meetings and thinking, God, aren't you listening? That was an important part, you know? Like, like, <laughs> are you not? 
I'm neurotic, if you couldn't tell. You know, I'm a little neurotic. And, and around that time, I'm at 22. Since 22, I haven't been on antipsychotic medication. I haven't been on anything. You know, I worked with a doctor, got off all of it. The 12 steps has healed most, for the most part, obviously. But, you know, like I, I, I live a happy and useful life. You know, there's just a little flavor. <laughs> it's a little zest. And, uh, and so I, I, she was drinking. I was going to Al-Anon. I didn't know what to do. I was getting guilted by that real authoritarian group of people, that, which by this time had grown into about 50. I was a high lieutenant in the charge for righteousness, you know. We had a vanguard moving eastward into heathen territory. It was like, you know, you, you fornicators and gamblers and alcoholics anonymous. You know, it was just very, very intense. And, uh, and Bill was my shadow sponsor about that time. Uh, and we, I'd talk to him. I'd talk to guys in our, in, in our program or in our, in our home group. You know, I'd met Matthew and, and Brooks became my boss and, and, and Bill, I just, and Steve Lamb and, and, uh, Pete B and JS and, uh, Clancy O and Mike and P and all these guys, five, 10. Oh, even better. Cause I just accepted it and then got it doubled. <laughs> uh, Acceptance is the answer. No, um, uh, but they just impacted my life, man, in such a positive way. And so I was crying and I was devastated. And I went over to Bill's house in the middle of the night and I sat down with him. And I mean, I'm, a, I'm working the steps. I'm reading the book. I'm doing the nightly 10th step written inventory. I've turned the 12 steps process into another self-interested exploration. There's a lot of people out here in this crowd who are probably writing so much inventory. It's just self-obsession, a-hole. It's just you're, you're so self-obsessed. You're still self-obsessed. It's the opposite of what we're trying to do up to a certain point, you know. But you got to get there first. got to be self-obsessed until the structure falls apart. The, the point of the structure is for it to dissolve and for another structure to rise in its place that serves a better purpose. And so when our belief systems crumble, it's part of the deal. The chaos rises. It's a psychological event. It happens. It's a natural thing, you know, and it's a part of the spiritual progression as well. And that moment in Bill's little basement, big, nice basement, we were talking and I was crying, man. I was crying. I didn't know what to do. I was being ostracized by this group. The girl left. I felt like I was just trying to do the right thing to not be in pain. I'm getting guilted for it in AA. Like, am I being dishonest? Cause I'm trying to like, seek relief. Like, I don't know what, what, what's happening and he held me while I cried, and he looked at me, and he said, Josh, you're okay the way you are. You're one of the good guys. I watch you helping people. I watch you doing the right thing. You're okay, buddy. This isn't going to kill you. You're okay. And up until that point, no one had ever told me that, or I had never listened. And he transformed me on a fundamental level. He changed something that was, was so passive and so loving and so compassionate that it slipped right beneath my intellect. It changed my heart. And I was the last one to know it. And I asked Bill to sponsor me. And I remember Jay coming up to me and saying, it was just Bill's sponsor. And Jay said, how, what better way to celebrate your fifth year in Alcoholics Anonymous or, or, or fifth year of sobriety than by joining the worldwide fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, cause we were in a little fringe group. And, um, and thus began my journey within. You burn all the roads without, and you're forced to go within. And I'm still in the process in different areas of my life, namely women. Let's just be honest from the podium. I can be a womanizer. And, uh, and I've had to take a look at that, you know? And I'm still, it's an ongoing look I'm taking. And, but I'm an honest womanizer, right? So then it's like, you get like, you, you can build yourself back up again. <laughs> well, I told her exactly what was happening, you know, no amends is due, but eventually after a certain point, it's just not, it loses its appeal. It falls away on its own. And I couldn't have done anything to end it or get to this level of consciousness within myself any sooner than has occurred, you know? And, uh, and I began to meditate and I remember around that time, Jay came up to me and he looked at me and he whispered in my ear and he said, everything you're going through right now is a story in your head. It's a story you tell yourself. And each time, if you'll notice, the story always is in the past or in the future. The story is never here. The story is always there. And I started to meditate, you know, and I started and I paid back the money. I paid back all the money. 
And I remember delaying all my amends and getting to the very last one only to find out that it was insurance fraud and sobriety. My car got totaled and stolen and I just cut out the things and then it got stolen again. And I pretended like I didn't, I wasn't the one who deployed the airbags or so I thought, but there was a computer who tracked it. So I had this guilty conscience about doing this this entire time, making all these amends, feeling spiritual. And I wait until the very last amends, which is going to be this farmer's insurance amends. It's going to be a big one, you know, maybe six, seven thousand dollars. I've already bought a new car. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it, but I'm just going to do it because I'm on fire. And I sat down for dinner. Up, I was up here visiting my uh, my my mom's good friend, my mom and dad's old good friends, uh, Val and Steve. We were all sitting down to dinner, and my mom looked over across the table and she's like, "Oh no, they knew the airbags had been deployed. There's a computer in that thing. Yeah, they deducted that before they paid you, because she it was her insurance." You know, so she just, I just did the thing and I just said, no, it's not. But they found out it was, she's the one who showed me the check and the paperwork. I had done everything trying to avoid that one amends that I didn't even need to make in the first place. (laughs) Because the universe works perfectly. God works perfectly. And when I say that, I mean that the same thing, the same thing. Most of the stuff that limits us from believing each other or hearing each other heart to heart is semantics. We are speaking about the same light. Buddhists, Christians, all of them, every single, the mystics, the Gnostics, the, you go down the line, we're all pointing at the same light. It's essentially the same thing. And these are all just references. The big book included is a reference. It's a pointer. What awaits us is experiential. It is not intellectual. And it has been my experience that the 12 steps is a subtraction process. Up until that point, it was about getting stuff and getting information. Then it began about it began to become about paring things away, and I lose power and the need to manage my own outcome of my life in the first step. And in the second step, I lose the need to solve my problem and the nature of my problem and offer a solution for myself. Going into the same thing that's broken already, seemingly, to fix itself. And in the third step, will in my life, I love this. This is beautiful. I think about it. This will, my will, what is that? We always, newcomers with all the questions, right? What is God's will? What is my will? <laughs> you know, what, what is the difference? And um, all the scholars in here, you know, scratching their neck. Uh, I was one of them. My will, I feel, is like my ambition. This is just the way I look at it because I think it's beautiful. And if you'll find out, most of your belief systems work that way too, <laughs> They're just beautiful and comforting, and that's what what works for us. brings us peace. Why not? (laughs) Will, my will is my ambition. It's what I want. It's essentially my future. I'm doing this so I can have that. And my life is what I have and what I've done and where I've come from. That's my past. And so I turn my past and my future over to to a care of a power greater than myself so that I can live in the moment today, which is all there is. This moment, everything has led up to this. In fact, we don't even suffer from past and future because they're abstractions. They don't really exist. What I suffer from is memory and imagination that both occur in the moment. There is no future. It has no mass. There is no time or space place where future exists. Sorry. (laughs) But keep planning. I'm worrying. (laughs) By all means. And so... And in the fourth step, all the reasons I had, like I had a big life story about why I was screwed, you know? And in the fifth step, I was, I'm just going to do this quickly. One minute. You cool with that? You're taping. I don't want anyone resentful. <laughs> I might force you to grow spiritually. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. And in the fifth step, I lost my one brick in that wall. I let some man in. And in the sixth step and the seventh step, all the things that helped me survive out there, are now liabilities in here where community is going to be the bedrock that holds me together. It's the connective tissue in Alcoholics Anonymous, the love of perfect strangers. This community is what heals us collectively. And in the eighth and ninth step, all the reasons I have for my destructive behavior and for killing everything before it can even start to breathe, for quitting every job before they can find out who I am, I go back and I make those things right until I have some semblance of self-esteem and can look my own self in the mirror. But it's a subtraction process. Ten is the same thing. It's four through nine over and over again, living examination, a life of examination, not self-obsession, not nightly 10 steps and afternoonly 10 steps and morningly 10 steps and trying to figure it out myself, 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 you know, and, and the 11th step, I start to lose my identity, my who I think I am. There's a space between my thoughts. Meditation isn't extra credit. And in the 12th step, I start to lose myself. 
I take these principles and make them more important. And like in the, the anonymity breakdown I tried to offer you in the beginning of the meeting, that there's something bigger here than me. And everything we have today has been is possible for millions of years. All the electronics in your pocket, your cars, your engines, gasoline, refinement, the satellites bouncing your signals back and forth. There are no new raw materials or elements on Earth, and there are no new physical laws. But what was needed was a shift of consciousness to observe laws already in motion. And if you take the 12 steps, if I, as I have taken the 12 steps, I hope you'll find, as I have found, that God gave you everything you needed to be complete the day that you were born that there is no hole. There is no God-shaped hole. The hole is in the mind, which is why nothing ever fills it. You're all perfect. I love you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.